Today's Sunday, July 15th, 2018. Summer is officially in session and it's getting pretty damn hot. 86 in here. When it gets this warm, a lot of people turn to LEDs or turn to upgrading the LEDs that they have already. And due to price, most likely, availability, a lot of people choose to go with the import lights uh, that you get on Amazon and eBay and other websites. Uh, basically, the, the more affordable lights um, that are around a dollar a watt, something in that neighborhood. I've got one of them here. And this one, believe it or not, is called the Penetrator. It's a four foot long, 270 watt fixture, clearly an import. And it has this round puck design that you're probably familiar with. And we're going to hack it. And you can hack just about any grow light on the market because a grow light is just a couple different component parts. It's some LEDs on a heat sink with a driver. Some have fans, some don't. One of the hallmarks of an import LED is they use very small, almost wafer thin heat sinks. Uh, aluminum's pretty expensive and it's heavy in comparison to the other components. And the more of it you can reduce, the cheaper the light can be, the more affordable it can be. They combat these small aluminum heat sinks by using active cooling fans. Now this is a brand new light I just opened up to figure out why it was making so much noise. And um, somehow the fan just kind of broke off. I don't see any impact damage, but we're gonna go ahead and hack it. And to do that, we're gonna need some information. Some of you may have seen my video from a couple of years ago on hacking an LED, but that was geared more towards a specific LED. And I'd like to empower you with uh, the skills and the information that you'll need to hack your own LED. I've learned quite a bit about LEDs over the last few years, but unfortunately I'm not an encyclopedia of every LED on the market. Um, I'm, I would imagine the comment section will look like it did last time. Hey, how many of this do I put on my, you know, my black dog or my kind or my Mars or whatever? I don't know. You know, you're going to have to f you know, find this out unless somebody wants to start some kind of forum thread where uh, there's a database of some kind. In the 30 minutes that it took me to set up for this video, I went ahead and opened up the case and flipped the light on just to kind of check out its operation. Of course, the light, uh, the light top with the fans is uh, on the counter, and uh, I figured I'd check it out and see you know, if fans are absolutely necessary for this, uh, this light. And boy, I gotta tell you, um, <laughs> quick tip, if you're gonna be messing with your light, probably leave it completely unplugged from the wall uh, this baby gets hot. Hey, Matt, come in here and touch this heat sink on the end here. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's hot. That's hot. Could yeah. you leave your hand on there comfortably for longer than a second? Uh, let's see. I mean, not. No. <laughs> could you, not would you? Okay. So without fans, this thing's running about 80 C. The fail point on these diodes is somewhere around 85 C. So quick tip there. Uh, absolutely 100% active cooled is necessary. And, and that can be kind of dangerous, you know, because if you... Uh, if you have a fan that goes out, you're, you're basically screwed. And maybe one of the reasons you're watching this video is because you have a, a cluster of LEDs that's gone out. Um, and sometimes the fan can be running, so cleaning the fans would be a good first step to any hack. But let's get into this driver situation. Um, most of the time you're gonna open up one of these fixtures, and yes, opening it up is gonna be required. There may be a void warranty sticker, but if you're already looking to hack your uh, fixture for whatever reason you, you feel like doing it, um, you may not be that concerned about uh, ripping the void sticker. Now, you're going to notice a, a lot of components in these, uh, these LEDs, especially these import LEDs. Um, typically, they're going to have a big kind of transformer looking thing and a small one. Uh, the small ones are typically your fan drivers. They're typically 12 volt. This one actually happens to be 15 volt. So I don't know if these are 15 volt fans or if it's overdriving it. We'll investigate that in a few moments. The larger boxes next door are the drivers for the LEDs. They take our wall power from uh, either our 120 volt US power or uh, this one looks like it's international so it can be plugged in in any country. They convert that AC current to DC current to power the LEDs. This one conveniently has a label, many do not, uh, but it has a strap over it. So I've gone ahead and taken the liberty of removing the strap on this one over here. And you'll notice it uh, has an input range of 100 to 240 volts. So that's the AC side. Now, many people email me and contact me and write questions, and they give me this data here. Um, I don't really, you know, I don't need that. Um, that's, you know, the voltage of your wall. What you need is the DC side. You need two things, DC voltage and DC amperage or current. That's gonna be in amps or milliamps. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, 
your options are probably going to be fairly limited because most of these LED drivers are somewhere in the high voltage, low current range. That means 80 to 160 volts DC out, but at only 500 milliamps or half of one amp DC. Some of them go as high as 600, 650, 700. The highest I've ever seen is 900 milliamps. Rarely will you have one that goes over one amp or 1000 milliamps. So your choices are gonna be very limited and we're gonna discuss that a little later in the video once we find out the stats on this driver. Because unfortunately, it has some numbers on it, but none of them are really useful to us. So for the first step in this hack, we wanna make sure that we're 100% unplugged from the wall, not just having the switch turned off, but actually completely unplugged from power. That's the first thing. Second, we're gonna need a multimeter. Now, multimeters can be scary. In fact, they scared me before I bought one and learned how to use it, but they're really not that tough. This one happens to be a, a very good one, a fluke. Uh, you can also use a six or $7 one from Harbor Freight. Uh, they're typically the red colored ones. They look something like this, and you can get coupons for them. You get them on sale pretty cheap. So the first thing we're gonna check here is the voltage of a driver. I've gone ahead and opened the plastic case for the top of this driver, although it probably wouldn't be necessary for every driver. I just felt like it would be a little better for the video so you can see. Now, you're gonna to wanna to be very careful of this area here. This is the AC in portion, so you're gonna have mains voltage coming in here. So you wanna be careful of all these components um, and power it up only when you need to take your measurement. The ports you're gonna be interested in testing are these two ports here. They typically are gonna have a red and black wire, which denotes DC out. To remove the wires, you can simply depress these little buttons here and you can remove the wires. Or if you can find a way to get your multimeter in those ports, uh, you can check the voltage that way. There are three ports on a multimeter. One is common or black or DC negative. Uh, that one will stay. The one on the right on this particular multimeter is for voltage, ohms, etc. The one on the left is for amps. It's a pass-through. So you're going to be in the voltage port on your multimeter. Now amps is a little more complicated because you can't just simply touch the wires to uh, what you're trying to test. You actually have to run current through the multimeter. Most multimeters have about a 10 amp uh, ability. I'm not sure what this one is. It's probably pretty good. So I'm gonna plug my positive back into the port from which it came. And I'm going to plug the negative into the negative of the driver. I think that'll stay pretty nice, hopefully. Now, ideally, I'd be using something like a banana clip or something that can clip the wire. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just very carefully touch these two wires together. I'll put my multimeter onto amps with the little dotted line, which denotes DC. The swirly one, or sine wave, it denotes AC power. Um, and we'll go ahead and check the current. Hey, how about that? 500 milliamps on the nose, or half of an amp. So I went ahead and stripped these wires a little further so I could get my multimeter pins in there with the LEDs hooked up. Looks like the LEDs need about 108 volts. And I'm noticing that they're pigtailed together or they're tied together in series with this connection here. So that means that each of these banks of LEDs is 54 volts. In series, you add up the voltage, so 54 and 54 is 108. That kind of makes a little more sense to us because we're running at a half an amp, right? So any voltage that we have, we can divide by a half, basically multiply by a half, uh, or divide by two to get our wattage. So these drivers clearly say on them that they're 55 watt drivers. It says output 55 right here. So if we take 108 times 0.5, 500 milliamps or divide by two, that gives us 54 watts. So we're getting the 54 out of the 55 watts. Pretty simple. All right, so now let's pull one of these LED pucks out and see if we can actually pull this off. Oftentimes they use the circuit board itself as a structural component, which is a little bit unfortunate. Ah, would you look at that? Our old friend, the Epistar diode. So this is your typical import LED package. It's an Epistar diode. This technology is around 
nine years old and has had some minor advances, but this is what's called an active slug-based diode. The diode package is inside of this miniature little heat sink package. It has some serious issues. One of the issues is that there are two thermal interfaces, one from the actual die itself into the slug base, another from the slug base into the PCB. This technology runs around 1.4 micromoles per joule, according to the economic analysis of greenhouse lighting by Dr. Bruce Bugby, as well as other people that have run this technology in lighting laboratories and integrating spheres. 1.4 micromoles per joule is about equivalent to a single-ended 1,000 watt HPS. So you're not necessarily much more efficient than an HPS with this technology, but it does lack the IR or infrared light that's associated with HPS or HID light sources. Despite that, you can see here that there are some infrared diodes in this light. You'll usually notice that by, uh, it's basically like a black dye at the center. Um, it's got a green diode in the center. The clear ones are typically a blue diode, a royal blue, and then it's got some reds. It looks like it's got some 660, 660, possibly some 630 nanometers. So this is kind of a multi-band LED. I wouldn't necessarily call it a full spectrum because uh, it's, it's basically multi-spectrum. It's spikes of uh, specific monochromatic spectra uh, tied together to try to fill the entire spectrum. So I'm not here to debate whether you should hack this light, um, but if you want to, uh, let's cover some of the options for you that will fit within the voltage range of this 55 watt driver. The circuit board itself is acting as the, as the mounting substrate, which is uh, definitely a, a very savvy cost-saving maneuver, let's put it that way. Uh, after unscrewing the PCB from this little baby heatsink, uh, you find something you don't really see every day in an import or Chinese grow light, a really nice silicone thermal pad that looks to be reusable. So that'll be nice. Uh, I think we're going to go with a cob on here and uh, this will be nice. We could even maybe use that uh, if we can maybe find a cob or something that'll match up with these holes. Otherwise, we might have to drill some new holes. So I think with these hacks, it comes down to if you're extremely budget limited or you, maybe you just bought a light or maybe the light failed out of warranty, this kind of thing might be worth it. I'll leave that up to you to decide. Most lights are probably not gonna be quite this challenging. So we'll go ahead and cut an aluminum plate to replace this circuit board and we'll be right back. Back with an aluminum plate. Luckily, I keep stuff like this around, but you go down to your local metal shop, check out their scrap bin, you can get a little piece. Uh, this is a 060 material and I uh, cut it, it's about 110 millimeters by 110 millimeters. It's about a little over four and a quarter inches by four and a quarter inches square, so pretty small. Um, so what we'll do is go ahead and transcribe these holes and we'll just uh, simply punch through, drill the holes, and we'll be able to mount this piece of aluminum to our heat sink and uh, we'll be able to mount a chip on board LED or some other kind of LED to replace this board. So now I need to select some LEDs that are going to go on this 108 volt, 500 milliamp driver. So ideally, if I could find something around 54 volts each, since the driver powers two of these clusters or two of these pucks. So I'm over here at rapidled.com over in their Cobb section. And I've done a little bit of browsing. I've browsed the Crees, I've browsed the Bridge Lux, the Citizen, the Luminous, and it looks like it looks like this one here, the Luminous CXM-22. I'll put a link in the description of the video along with the coupon code GROWMOUSE for 5% off at Rapid LED. These are only 19 bucks. And so I'm putting myself in the mind of someone that maybe has a fixture like this, like one of the old Platinums that has the same round pucks or one of the many import lights that uses this same round optic. If you are someone doing a repair, this is probably what I go with right here. Uh, they're only 19 bucks. Uh, it looks like the forward voltage is 51.5 volts, so that's going to work great for us. Uh, we're going to be a couple volts under factory, so we're going to get the same wattage, going to get a lot more efficiency, uh, probably on the order of around 35% more light per watt out of one of these as opposed to one of the 10-year-old Epistar China technology. So we're going to go for a couple of these. Now, we can opt to add the holder for an extra $2.50. And the holders are really nice if you want to uh, use those, you can. But uh, these have a little hole, a couple holes in it. We can mount the, the cob directly to this little aluminum plate and save, some, uh, save a few bucks here or there. Well, the cobs and cob holders came in, and I, I got to be honest with you guys. Uh, it just, this just keeps getting worse. 
uh, I'm going to stick with this video. Cop holders don't fit. So that sucks. Uh, so we're just going to have to, luckily we got, uh, got some cobs that have holes in the corner. So uh, we're going to go ahead and mount these up. Uh, because the cob holders don't fit, that means we're soldering, that means we're drilling, that means we're tapping, and uh, the nightmare is real. Shout out to Marco Reps. I love this screwdriver. Let's solder. All right, we're uh, using Kester brand solder, 96.5% tin, uh, silver 3%, copper 5%. Running at 750 degrees Fahrenheit. We're gonna tin these pads. Get a nice bubble on there. We're gonna use the factory wires. We're gonna snip them. We're gonna, we're gonna strip them out to four millimeters. There we go. Well, let's just get some fresh tin. This solder has flux in it. Makes it a little easier to stick, especially for beginning soldering people. All right. With everything tinned, we've got our wire tinned, our cob tinned, and a tip of our soldering iron tinned. It's just, it's just a quick touch. We'll do the same for the positive side. Finally, we'll give it a quick clean with some isopropyl alcohol, which is on most manufacturer's spec sheets as an approved material for cleaning the chip on board LED itself, and great at removing that extra flux factory wire with connector right on there. So aside from a couple quick and easy solder points, uh, we're wired up. We're ready to uh, put it back in the way it came out. So when you're done with the job, you're probably going to look something like this. It takes a factory finished product, uh, however crappy it is, and uh, makes it look like a piece of sheet metal with a cob on it. But in this next part of the video, I'm going to show you how to do it a little cooler. So if you have a 3D printer or access to a 3D printer, a friend with one, I uh, came up with the design and I invested some time in this because I feel like this PCB with these epistars on it is common. I feel like I've seen it. And I think as a community, uh, I'll put the measurements up on a website called Thingiverse along with the design. You can download it for free. I'll put a link in the description and uh, we can check this out and test it and see if it fits other popular uh, LED import lights. Uh, like I believe maybe some of the kind K3, K5, um, the smaller models, maybe some of the Platinums. Um, that's not throwing shade at these people. It's just saying they, they use a similar uh, light engine that this uh, particular import did. So I uh, designed this cob holder out of a high temperature plastic called PETG. It's, uh, it doesn't even soften until you get up in that ADC range. So um, I tested this. This seems to work great as a reflector. I've used plastic reflectors in the past with my Cree cobs uh, from the company Lettle, a uh, popular optics company. And it, it really uh, improved the fit and finish of this light. This is something I could actually sell now on eBay. Put it back from whence it came. Uh, the warm 3000 or 3500K Kelvin cobs uh, has really helped fill out the spectrum and uh, it might be something you could consider doing uh, if you were duped into buying something you thought was full spectrum when in fact it's just a collection of different monochromatic LEDs hoping to simulate full spectrum. So there you go guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and please me, leave me a comment, let me know if you have one of these popular lights and uh, you know maybe leave the diameter of your optic and um, We'll have a nice knowledge base for the people that watch this video over the years to come. All right, cheers. See you on the next one.